I'm Tim Taylor, and it's Sunday just before church on July 28th. I want to share with you about love, war, and peace. Now, most of you know that I come from a background with uh, in the Navy. The way I was called, uh, my very uh, naval career models the etymology of the word apostle. And so I studied war. And so it's important to recognize we are in a cultural war today. Now, in actual war, if you understand the lay of the land, you can use that to your advantage because there are features in the land that can give you a strategic advantage if you know how to use that feature. For example, it's wise to take the high ground because the high ground gives you an advantage. And so part of what happens in a culture war, in a culture war, war uh, words are used to frame the battlefield. He who controls the language controls the lay of the land. And so part of what's happening here, there are false strongholds being built with lies. Why do they do that? Because they are trying to create a faux or false moral high ground. Why? Because it gives them a strategic advantage in the culture war. When you realize in this culture war, it actually started in Revelation chapter 12, where the Satan and his angels, the devil and his angels were cast out to earth. And it talks about how they went, to, they went to make war with the remnant of God's seed and those who keep the commands of the Lord. Now, this morning at church, I'm going to share with our little congregation about the 50 commands of Christ. But we find in uh, Matthew, find the scripture here, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, uh, we find Jesus sums up all the commands in two. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So if you understand those two things and let that govern your heart, you will fulfill all the other commands because love will compel you to do so. But I submit to you, most people have no clue where this portion of scripture came from, where it says, the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now check this out. Check this out. Leviticus 19.17 says this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. That word rebuke means to chastise, to plead, to correct, to rebuke. It says, you shall not bear sin because of him. You, you shall confront him. Why? Because the goal is to remove the offense that's actually breaking relationship. It's to remove this thing called sin. Sin hurts people. Okay. If you do not take, you shall not take vengeance nor bear a grudge against any of the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. So the context of loving your neighbor has to do with speaking the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 teaches us that, where the Apostle Paul talks about how the fivefold ministry was given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and part of the goal is to, because there's going to be liars and slanderers and those people that are twisting the truth in those days, but the fivefold is to equip you with the truth. And it says, speaking the truth in love. That's what it says. Ephesians 4.15. Jesus. Let's go over here, back over here. In 1 John chapter 4, we discover that God is love. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, so we to love one another. So what did Jesus do? John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first before it hated you. If you were in the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not in the world and I chose you 
out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Why? If I had, verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin because he who hates me hates my father also. You'll also understand that following that, Jesus says, I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. You see, we are in a cosmic war. We are in a cultural war. There's different spheres of society. There is the uh, church, business, government, media, education, healthcare, family, or when I say church, I could refer to the religious sphere. There's also the fivefold ministry that functions in all that. And part of my role apostolically is to give you strategic wisdom on how to fight in this cultural war. And, um, and right now, our adversary has used language to frame a narrative in this cultural war. And so many have been manipulated and confused by what's going on in this cultural war. So, for example, they make things up. It's, they make things up. In other words, they make up lies. That's, that's part of the nature of Satan. It says, as a matter of fact, you find this scripture. In John 8, 43, Jesus says, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil. Now, the word devil is translated from diablos. It means false accuser, a slanderer, Satan, the devil. That's the thing that he does. So the false accusations using the three-letter agencies and lawfare illegally and wrongly to on a political person to violate all kinds of laws and to lie and slander someone when you yourself are doing the very thing you accuse others of. And when I say that, what are you referring to? Let's say Burisma. Let's talk about the Steele dossier, for example. All proven lies. Hunter's laptop. On and on we could go. But I'm getting off on a tangent. My point is, in a cultural war, we have Isaiah 5, 20 being made manifest. They call evil good and good evil. Well, that's what the devil's doing. It says, you do not, Jesus says, you don't understand my speech because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. You are a slanderer, a liar, a false accuser. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. I bring to you the policy and laws that have uh, made abortion the murder of the most innocent and defenseless. Murder. That's part of the demon crap policy platform. That's why I call them demon crats. It's not to be insulting. It's to shock you into being aware of the truth. Because that, my friends, is a demonic ideology, just as is their policies and laws as it pertains to the transgender stuff, to the uh, other things like that. They're contrary to God's word that destroy family, destroy individual identity. My friends, that is literally doctrines of demons that are on that, that are forming that, framing that policy platform of the Democrat Party. It says he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. It's no surprise when there's so much lies. And it's not just the Democrats. It's also the rhinos, the people that pretend they're Republicans and so on and so forth. And here it's not even in one sense. I don't want to even make this a political thing, though. This is merely a cosmic war from Revelation 12 that's built from heaven to earth that's being played out in the political and slash the governmental realm. By the way, do you, you know why politics isn't mentioned in Scripture? The government is. It's because politics has to do with the art of compromise. And what you find in politics is people make compromises for their own personal agenda. Personal power, personal pride, all that kind of stuff like that. It just, it just reeks of self-interest versus servant leadership in real government which is what the scripture would present. But it goes on to say in uh, John 8, 44, uh, 4, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources because he's a liar and the father of it. But I tell you the truth, but you do not believe me. Behold, that's what we have today. We have people today that are more angry at the people exposing things like this than are the people that have habitually, consistently lied to you. If we were to take this spiritual war from... Um, 
in the political realm to the healthcare realm, we could point to Fauci, which was found from the very beginning with regard to the whole COVID thing. What happened? He was caught lying time and again for decades. And so all this keeps coming out. But the thing is, is I bring this up to highlight this one thing. Consider this a public service announcement. If you choose to partake of media and people or organizations that continually espouse lies, you will be fooled. If you are fooled, you become a fool. When you recognize socialism came from Marx and Lenin's ideology presented in the Communist Manifesto, they had three goals, remove God, remove family, remove the individual identity. Uh, lying was a perfectly acceptable thing to them because their goal was to make the state translation them, the small uh, dictators, oligarchs, whatever form of fascism that you want to use, that's what they were doing for their own thing. And therefore, they tried to undermine truth to basically create their own world. And we see how that's worked. It has been nothing but destruction, murder. Oh, my goodness. The history of that is just horrendous. And when you choose to believe those lies, when you choose to, to adhere to their ideology, you become a fool. Lenin, who was a practitioner of uh, Marx and Engels' work in the communist uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, beginning of it. He termed the people that were fools, he termed the phrase useful idiots. And today, that's what we have still going on. People who um, become useful idiots. Now, part of the reason I'm bringing this up is because if it says in 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the evil one. And so, the context of that, let me find the scripture. Context of what I just quoted is this, starting in verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Remember, devil means slander or false accuser. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil, the slanderer, the accuser. So if a if the devil, Satan, is the father of lies, how do you destroy a lie? With the truth. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, but a seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he's been born of God. So if we're going to be like Jesus, then we have to confront the, uh, the lies with the truth. Now, something I would make note of is today I've noticed something in our society and that is now roughly only 1% of the population in America has even served in the military. And what you'll find is in the military, people tend to lay their life down for love of country. And Jesus says, he talks about loving each other where we lay our lives down one for another. And because that's so few that actually do this. And part of the premise I would make is, is this. Much of the church today sees avoidance of conflict as love, when in truth is just cowardice, masked in feigned wisdom or selective ignorance. Hebrews, excuse me, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest. Because you've forgotten the law of God, I will also forgive your children. And my point is, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, therefore love speaks the truth. That's what it says in Ephesians 14. It says, speaking the truth in love. And so my point is this. Um, in the founding of this nation, there was roughly 3%. They call them the 3%ers today. It refers to history. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's really a small group of people that really went to war and actually fought. It set everyone free. And so it is today. There's a remnant God's raising up who will love enough to run towards the battle instead of running from the battle to avoid it. And the reason I bring this up is because in Revelation chapter 21, we find that it says, he who overcomes, verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Cowardly means fearful, which is very contrary to what 
the Bible says we ought to be in Ephesians 3, 17, where Paul prays that we be loveful, because he says that Christ being dwelling in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what the link what the width, the length, the depth, the height to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. God is love. God wants us to be like him. So I pray this has been helpful, inspiring to you, and my hope is to inspire you to learn the truth, to present the truth, because if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Shalom and have a blessed Sunday.